some questions and things like that I don't know but you think about <coughs> for example there are many questions uh, you know you want to know uh, on church on things on morality or many things you know if you have questions only thing is that you just ask me or you know inform me before I get to the class otherwise we will continue now scripture studies more and more okay maybe we can accumulate questions you know as if we write questions down and accumulate them and then dedicate one day just to go through the questions ah, yeah that's a uh, question means you know I think you know if suppose say you ask a question I give an answer maybe that needed five minutes or ten minutes mm -hmm. simple questions but you know there are some themes for example somebody asked father what is about what are you talking about the crusades many times there are people accusing on Catholic Church uh, on crusades and the Protestants and most of the church history books were written by the, the Protestant authors and uh, uh, almost unjustifiably uh, they were, they were, they, all of them accusing the Catholic Church of crusades a kind of some kind of atrocities uh, you know done to the humanity and uh, mock it Uh, the Catholic Church and we have to know of course the Crusades were there there were cruelties of course but how it started how it went on and why these things came in then we will have a better understanding of the things <coughs> or some ask sometimes father the question regarding Galileo Galilee the church persecuting The, the, the scientists and many even now mistakenly believing that uh, the church is against science what really happened you know the historical things and these people uh, even now because these books are in you know, a very partial truth very things have happened some and why and they simply cover up you know somewhere or other or don't explain it So, such questions, if you have real, then you have to just uh, tell me that theme and how it started and then developed, you know. There are so many things like that. So, for starting from, you know, beginning, that won't be easy, you know, to go on. You understand? There are so many themes. If anybody is interested in some very, very interesting, a simple question for five or ten minutes, we can at once answer the question. But if it is a, a theme to be developed in, of course, you know, let me know a little earlier so that I can have precise data. Okay. Um, now we turn to the scripture, especially what we are going to see. I think now what I started is about New Testament. Okay. <coughs> Or do you need the Old Testament? What is about your... You know, by, why? Because I'm going... You know, not simply about the scripture, but we are going to, you know, really go into the scripture books. So, uh, what I have prepared today is for... is for Gospel of Matthew. The New Testament, Gospel of Matthew, because that is the first book of the New Testament. So, just go for the first <coughs> book first. There is no reason why I chose Gospel of Matthew. The only thing is that that is the first book of the Bible, I have New Testament. Well, I, I when we got started, we, we did a, an old, a quick overview of the Old Testament, which took like a year and a half. It was pretty quick. <laughs> uh, and we were actually going to start a study on Matthew. New, okay. You know, so um, uh, I, I guess we can help fill in on the Old Testament relationships yeah. for the newcomers to the class. Yeah, okay, we will, then we will go on with the Gospel of Matthew, okay? Uh, that is before, you know, this is a simple, these are, you know, there are, I just prepared five, uh, six pages. These are mainly, you know, some of the The, uh, who is the author, who is the, the audience, and then structure, then uh, things like that, you know. These are, these are all those things, not interpretations. We have already seen how to interpret the Bible, eh? the tools we have already, how to interpret. I told you, at least there are 
very prevalent three interpretations. Three kinds of interpretation. No? But so, you know, we started with the, all those things, you know, the, how the formation of Gospels and how to interpret it. That's already discussed before, you know, uh, months ago. Uh, at least what is uh, the three kinds of interpretation means when you read the Bible, there is what's called literary interpretation. What do you mean by literary interpretation? Just as you read it. Just as you go, as you read, you understand and say that is the thing. For example, very simple example is God created the world in six days. So, we interpret it six days as it is. God in, uh, in, uh, created the world in six days. And the seventh day, we rested. That's why God asked us, you know, to have on the seventh day, Sabbath day, to rest. So, but there is a, what's called a moral interpretation. What do you mean by moral interpretation? Moral interpretation means that is connected with our life. No? So why these six days God created? How we can moral, moral, how can we give a moral interpretation to that? <coughs> Six days need not be as it is six days. It is because this is the way how to you know, interpret moral interpretation means to connect it with our life. So man needs one day of rest and one day dedicated to God. So that is the seventh day. So in order that in order to highlight the seventh day, the importance of the seventh day, the scripture says, yes, there are six days of work. And the seventh day you dedicate to God and to yourself. <coughs> so that is, in order that, you know, in order to highlight the importance of the seventh day, so the six days are, you know, assigned as work. And it need not be, you know, uh, God created in six days, but that is the structure given because of this reason. That's a moral interpretation. Why? And therefore, we have to rest and dedicate this day to God and ourselves. This is the... Uh, the, the it's very clear, no? Very clear. That is... Uh, uh, no, but, you know, if you... The problem with the literary interpretation is... Then God created in six days. Then people can very, you know, easily ask questions. Does God need six day, days to create these things? Is not He, uh, you know, might enough to create in one word everything? Then why should? But if you're eternal, what's the hurry? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is the, that is the question. Then why it is six days? It's not seven days or ten days. So all these questions can come. So the literary interpretation has this much of weakness, you know, to explain these things. And there are many, many things. And the literary interpretation always say, what is written is the word of God. It is true and without any, you know, <coughs> We cannot simply impose our own interpretation. That is the, the, the idea behind you know, the most of them, you know, they say about the literal interpretation. But we know there are many, many things to be taken into consideration. So there are so many things. Scientific discoveries now can help and, of course, challenge also the literal interpretations. There are so many things like that. This biblical... Uh, idea of creation was, you know, based on what's called a, a geocentric idea of the world. The world, no? That means the earth is the center of the world and everything revolves around that and the sun goes around the world uh, the, the, because the sun rises and sets. That's why when the Israelites coming into the, the, to the land and Moses was there, and they were, you know, attacking Jericho. 
And, you know, Moses was praying. Whenever he stretched out his hand and prayed, the sun stopped. The sun stopped. And then, after some time, you know, he was so tired, when his hands went down, the sun began to move. So they have to finish it. The conquering of the, uh, the, uh, the city that day itself. So, and there were two people who, you know, just supported so that, you know, the sun did not move. Hmm. So, these are things that are narrated in the Bible. So, these are because, you know, this is on the concept that, you know, the sun revolves or, you know, goes around, you know, and, those. and this is the earth is flat yeah. because as it is seen it is flat and upon that there is a uh, there is a level of firmament in which you know the water is collected in and the, and the, and the, and the rain is because there are holes and comes around so these are the concept by which you know the uh, that uh, Old Testament is written and with the new scientific discovery, we won't be able to interpret all these things in a literal way. So, we have to recourse to some other ways. That is moral interpretation. Then there is the third interpretation, what we call is a spiritual or allegorical interpretation. Allegorical interpretation or we can say a spiritual interpretation. So why this is given? So. We give more, for example, <coughs> this, these seven days are, you know, these are simple symbols. Why don't we think about seven, it's only a literary style. It's a kind of, you know, these are all interpretations what we can, you know. This is, see, the creation. Look, God creates. Even in that, there is a kind of evolution is, is seen in the creation of God. In the creation account, it's very obvious. If you see a little bit further, it's very obvious that there is an evolution process is there. First God created the firmament. That means the world. Then there is the light. That means the world in which you know those things, the light. That means sun and moon and things like that. This is why... This why context and what you are reading uh, is so important because <clears throat> Genesis is, especially the creation story, is ancient <coughs> poetry. It's a poetic style. And the, the, one of the things I came across that I thought was really interesting, in the six days of creation there's four different verbs used. Created, which means created from nothing, formed and made, implying using existing materials, and then founded, which means based on a design. Those are four different verbs in the six days of creation. So these are the things, you know, <coughs> these are the things how we interpret what we call literary genre. Literary genre. So what are the verbs used? What are the styles of narration? What are the symbols we find out, find in that narration? What are circumstances in which it is written? What are the circumstances outside of the Bible and that are used in the Bible? Or the yeah. What did, what did you call it? Literary genre. <coughs> That's a new one. That's a new one. Oh, this is like <laughs> very good. <laughs> Literary Jenner. No, 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 here it's not. Not here, here. Oh, you, you will not read it as I write. J N R E, Jenner. <coughs> Lit. Terrari general. That means not simply the thing that is seen, the thing that is seen as it is, no. Not only the thing that are just you know, connected with our life, no, we go a little further and more. For example, what Glenn said, no? 
there are four different words used. But as we read in English, we don't understand that, you know, because it's all created, sometimes made. They did not make, the translators did not make a distinction. And most of them, no. <coughs> because, you know, but as I just uh, give an example, there are deeper understanding differences of uh, understanding the word created, made, formed. Now, what is the difference between chronos and uh, time? Chronos. Chrono, what is chronography? Chronography. In, in Greek there are at least two words for time. One is chronos. Means time. Time. Just a time. And connected with there is a God. I think chronos. And there is the word time. I don't exactly remember that word. I, but there is another very good, you know, very easy to understand, you know. Yeah, from that word chronos means chronography comes. Chronometer? Ah, chronometer and all those because connected with God. Uh, with time. There is and that time is what we call, you know, time eternal. There is another type word, word called, you know, I think that I exactly uh, forgot the word, but Kairos. Yes, Kairos. So, Kronos and Kairos. So, Kairos is the, what's what we call Kairos is God designed world, uh, the time, salvation, or that what I said, you know, that was mistaken. That is, uh, Kairos is that something, you know, eternal and we relate itself to the, what's called the time of salvation, connected with God, Kairos. And Kronos means the time what we meet every day. So they use it with very, very clear distinction in Greek language. But when it is translated into English, there is no distinction in English, you know, these two words. They have to describe it. There is no clear word for that. And so the translators, what they did? They just, you know, translated time. And doesn't make any distinction in our mind, set up the Kairos and the Kronos. But it has a real difference of meaning. Or oh, another word for is very, another thing is for example, love. We translate every love, love. How many loves are there? Three. One is philios in, in Greek. Another is eros. eros. And third one is agape. And in English we all translate love. love. And do we get real understanding of it? When I was a kid, I remember hearing the story of Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? And yeah. he asked him three times. And I thought, what's the point of this? It make Jesus sound really dim, like he had asked three times. <laughs> <laughs> but when you find out that he's asking in agape, and Peter's answering Philios, and the third time Jesus asked using Philip, now it's Peter is the one who doesn't get it. <laughs> yeah. That whole story got turned up around because of the translation of the words. See, the difference is that we, when we just read the Bible, we don't get it because of the translator's problem. That's why every time there is a new translation of the Bible, it doesn't stop. There are ever so many kinds of Bible and we have to be careful about also. And those, every translation is an interpretation, you know that. Mm -hmm. And Hebrew is notorious for using words with double meanings. <laughs> yeah. uh, the word that they used when the last plague of Egypt, where darkness covered the land, that particular Hebrew word means physical darkness. It also means chaos. So what was it? Was it darkness? Or, or chaos. chaos? Or was it both? So, yeah, see, what I'm saying, you know, for example, so if we don't, we don't understand, philios means what we call, it's a love between father and son. And what is Eros? It's a love between husband and wife. 
and agape is the love between God and man. If we don't understand, when we use the word eros for a, a relation between God and man, we are totally mistaken, no? Or, when we use the love between father and son, instead of filios, when we use eros, that is totally wrong. So that is the, the problem of interpretation, what I, you know, what I am saying. So, this literary genre, all these things take into con consideration. Why this word is used, why it is not the you because what are the meaning of this word in a general context? And what is this word particularly meaning in, in the Bible, the here, what it means? Or very simple is, uh, you know, in creation account we say Adam, New Eve. No? English translation is that. Adam, new <coughs> Eve. And from knowledge, somebody is born. <laughs> In Bible it is. it is. It is written, Adam, new Eve. Can you, can you conceive the idea you know, by knowledge, somebody is born? <laughs> no, but what is the meaning of new? Adam new if means, you know, new through and through, no? Without mask. <laughs> complete, no? Complete different meaning. It. <coughs> that is a complete different meaning. When we just take Adam new if means if you don't understand that word, you know, we are totally mistaken. <coughs> So that's why I'm saying always we have to understand a little bit of uh, the literary genre. So uh, these all those things that we have already seen uh, you know, months ago. Now let us come to Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew. These are you know just to, to recall your mind what we have already seen month, months ago. We have I think dedicated these things some classes. On this, already. Yes, if you rewind a little bit back, you'll see that. Uh, to, okay. Bible, you know, another thing is we have to see the first three Gospels are called Synoptic Gospels. Why it is called Synoptic Gospels? The, the first three, they are similar. And we all know that, you know, the first three Gospels have intercollected. Almost they have the same structure. <coughs> they have the, most of these incidents are narrated, you know, are the same, the, the sequence. And uh, there are, you know, of these three, uh, repetition of, uh, you know, incidents. But Gospel of John is entirely different. Very few things are, you know, uh, repeated from the synoptic to the, uh, to the Gospel of John. And most of the things what we what see in, in the Gospel of John is not narrated in the synoptic Gospels. That's why the early fathers, one of the father, fathers of the church, who is called Tassian, Tassian, he found out, oh, what is the use of this, all this, you know, repeating, you know, all these three books, the same story. So, he created a new gospel. And that is called Dia Thessaron. Dia Thessaron. Dia Thessaron. That means, out of four gospels. The meaning is, Dia Thessaron means, out of Four Gospels, the idea idea is that he put together all the four Gospels and made a chronologically ordered one Gospel out of four Gospels. So starting from, you know, in the beginning was the Word, no? So the Word, you know, that is the part of John and putting the infant's narrative and then, you know, just go, going on until it became one Gospel. All the repetitions he just removed and made one gospel and that is called the Thessalon and people found it to be very very 
practical. And therefore, it had a very, very popular circulation. And the church at last, you know, asked the people not to use it in the church, at least for liturgical purpose. No, because this gospel is not inspired. Inspired gospel. So the inspired gospels are four. And this is a simply a history. So we cannot use it in the liturgical services. If you for your purpose of reading, that's okay, but not more. It's like making a resume out of everything together, you know. Not simply a resume, but avoiding all the repetitions, you know, just arrange the gospel in a chronologically sequence, you know, way. That is Tassian. How long here was that father? About 100 or 150? No, I think he lived in, in uh, uh, 300. 200, 300, I think. Yeah. Okay. So this, this synoptic uh, problems, we can say, and one thing, how the interdependence? One thing we have to understand is just uh, uh, just uh, Thing is, by the way, is that still in publication? Eh? Yeah, testosterone. Sure. Okay. You can just you know Google too. Very simple. <laughs> very simple it is. Very easy to find out. Even the text you can get in from the from the from the online. The yeah, testosterone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a uh, there is a Tassian the testosterone. Just, you know, Google it, you know, or, you know, just, you can have the text, even the text. The synoptics are also published, which is really good, where you can compare, they're written almost in three columns a day. The synoptics? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Epheseron doesn't have any relation with the synoptic gospels on problems. Only thing is that it is, you know, putting together all the four gospels together. Yeah. So, here comes now uh, the problem, you know, the interdependence. So, the, the traditional understanding of uh, the church is Gospel of Matthew is the first one started. The first Gospel is Gospel of Matthew. And Mark and Luke made use of Gospel of Matthew as a what's called source, a basic source and then, that means uh, Matthew. Eh? Matthew is the basic for Luke uh, uh, and Mark. <laughs> of course, Mark and Luke they have, oh, they have their own diff different sources. That's why things which we see in Luke, we don't see some of them in Mark. So, therefore, they have their own. For example. Mark as well as plus something his own, okay? The Luke can let us make this way. The Mark and Matthew and Luke. This is the something this way also. So uh, Matthew and uh, you know some specific source for Mark and together ma was made uh, these gospels. Okay, you got it. The basic understanding, you know, basis of. Uh, uh, basis of uh, these two Gospels are uh, the what's called the Gospel of Matthew. That was the traditional understanding. And St. Augustine holds, the fathers like St. Augustine and people hold this understanding. And that was the, the Catholic Church's, you know, most popular understanding, you know. But the Protestants doesn't accept that. Most of the others, Protestant others, doesn't accept it, and as you and for your knowledge, the great scriptures, scripture scholars are mostly Protestants, <clears throat> and the most important theory now. These are all theories, you, you know. Please hold it, opinions and theories. So the most popular and accepted theory is Mark is the. What's called Mark is the 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 source for two other gospels, Matthew uh, and uh, Matthew. 
Luke. So Mark forms. Yeah, Mark forms the basis of the gospel. You know, for the other two gospels, upon which these two build, and together with they say there was a there was a another common tradition. They call it Q. Q. Q means in great in that is a German scholar who proposed this. He you know Q means quelle. That's a German word. Quelle means source. That's all. Source. So there is a so Mark being the the common what's called the common source sharing shared by Matthew and Luke. And there is another source which is called Q. Okay, so Matthew has now Mark and Q, both of them a little bit, and then something you know, you know their own, their own. So almost like these three things, Mark and another source Q, and plus there is a specific some source you know for Matthew and Luke. This way. The gospel is, for, you know, the two gospels are formed, you know, based on Mark, Matthew, and Luke. That's why there are, you know, uh, there are similarities and there are dissimilarities. And the other so source, quelle, who, who is this guy? No, no, we don't know. That's a tradition, you know, maybe a oral tradition. <coughs> Nobody wrote it, or even somebody wrote it, and you know, could not preserve. You know, for your information. The first manuscript of the the canonical gospels. There are four canonical gospels, no? And these four canonical gospels. Anyway, somebody has written it, no? Fully. And no original manuscript is preserved now. No. That means we understand. For example, the Gospel of Mark. Mark wrote it. Okay. The written Handwritten original manuscript written by Mark is it's not preserved now. So also with Matthew, Luke, and all other all all other you know uh, scripture, no original manuscript is preserved. Only what we have is the copies. Mm -hmm. Copies of copies. Yeah, and copies of cop oh, thousand times you know, and the most. Popular, you know, the most ancient uh, manuscripts are, you know, I think there are two mainly. One, we, one is called, you know, the manuscripts put together in the Vatican archives, and that is called Codex Vaticanus. And there is. Eh? We have original copies? No. 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 <laughs> and another thing is, another thing is uh, Codex Sinaiticus. So that is that was a, a codex or put together that was kept. I think that was in in the Sinai uh, monastery, and that was later transferred to I think uh, either in British Museum or in Paris. So we don't have a chronological order of which one was written first, and then another one. No. Yeah. Or, or yeah, we have. You know, by studies we can understand that. <coughs> Oh, yeah. They were all written in the same hundred years. Almost, yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. All the whole test, the whole New Testament is written in about a hundred years. Yes, sir. You know, even less than. Yeah, less than. It's only, I think, it's only a question of maybe fifty years. That's all. So they can be very close to each other. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, in the first figure, you're saying that Matthew is the source for Luke and Mark. Yeah. In the second figure, you're saying that Mark is the source of the Matthew. source for Matthew and. Oh, this is there is nothing to do with the theory. The I wrote, you know, just theory. I think oh, one the, thing, this other dude thinks oh, another. Okay. No, 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 this is uh, Mark, and this is Luke. Well, the, the same. These are theories, you know. Okay. The same debate goes on with in the Jewish community in the in the Old Testament. Yes. Where they're saying what is the source, you know, what, oh. 
who wrote this? Was Daniel written at the time of the uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. exile or later? Oh, these are these are studies. Please, you know, it's for you for, for your information. That's all. Not something you know. You take it. You are free to accept this theory or this theory or n none of them. Nothing problem. It's only a study, scientific studies, you know, going on for a better understanding. That's all. Somebody can say that. Oh no! No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, if you can say that, and then you can prove it with internal and external evidences. So this is the and there is a tradition that is interesting. Another theory. Another theory more, one more theory. If I complicate it, please, you know, tell me. <laughs> tell me, and then I'll stop it. There is another theory. They say, of course, Gospel of Matthew, what we have is now, is not originally written by the Apostle Matthew. <coughs> because there was a a Gospel of Matthew written in Hebrew or Aramaic. So there was a Gospel of Matthew first written in Hebrew or, you know, or Aramaic, but we say that's the same. And, uh, and that was the Gospel of Matthew what the traditionally taken as the basis for other Gospels. But somewhere or other that was lost. And what we have the Gospel of Matthew is either an adaptation to that or a translation or something like that. And not the author of Matthew, present Gospel, the author of Matthew is not really the Apostle Matthew. But it was, it was, uh, you know, it was... Uh, believed because that gospel somewhere or other connected with the gospel of gospel of Matthew, sure. So, and there is an interconnected tradition, very interesting, very remote interconnected tradition is there that we can read in the ecclesiastical history of uh, ecclesiastical history of uh, Eusebius, written in the fourth century, in which he says. I don't know, this is going to be very complicated for you, for me, no, because, you know, because this is the thing. He, you know, as a, uh, Eusebius was the, I think he wrote in 320, 25, between the book, what we call the history of the church, ecclesiastical history, that is the first history church, a church history book. Who is that author, you know? Eusebius of Caesarea. Eusebius. And he says that is the first history book. And he says there was a tradition in which I told you, you know, something about the, the, the Alexandrian community, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was a school of catechism founded by a man called Panthenus. <coughs> Panthenus. Hmm? Panthenus. Why I am saying, you know, because there is a connected with my, you know, India. That's why I'm interested in saying that. <laughs> yeah. This Panthenus man who was the founder of the catechetical school of Alexandria and whose disciple was St. Clement and whose disciple was Origen. We were talking about, no? Origen. Yeah. So this Panthenus was teaching in Alexandria. And that was in the, uh, that was in the, the, almost in the third century, I mean, two thousand, two hundreds. And at that time, there was a community in India already. Apostle Thomas and another tradition says Apostle Bartholomew went to India and preached. At least one thing was very clear, there was a, there was a community, a Christian community in India. And there was a problem there, some kind of uh, dispute rose, and, and uh, nobody was there to solve the question. And the Indians invited Panthenus, who was the great, popular, famous you know, teacher of Christianity. 
And he went to India and then cleared the problem and returned to Alexandria. While returning, the Indians presented him the copy of the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew. <coughs> what I said, you know, this because this theory is connected with that. That's why there was a Gospel of Matthew written in Hebrew and uh, that was lost. And there is a theory going on like that. And that is connected with a historical event narrated in the 4th century by Eusebius of Caesarea. Could that be the cue that they're talking about in this, in this, this other theory here? Could be. Uh, See. Because the cue theory, as I understand, is they, there seems to be a reference that they're going to that they don't know what it is. And these are all, you know, why this is written by, you know, Eusebius, of course, writing in the 4th century, 320s, a history book. And these things was not very easily verifiable for him. So what he wrote was, don't think, you know, he was writing with all the historical standards as today, with, based on all documents. No. He was writing this one based on a popular belief of the people at that time. People popularly believed that St. Thomas the Apostle went and preached in India and they brought a copy of, Spontanus brought a copy of the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew. So we can connect this theory or this historical narration by Eusebius to this theory. That means there was a Gospel of Matthew written in Hebrew and that was lost. What we find, the New Testament Gospel of Matthew written in Greek is, a, is either an adaptation to that or a translation. Either way, the author is Matthew, you know. If it is translation, no problem. But the, the real author is Matthew, if it is a translation. Or if it is an adaptation, of course, the real author is Matthew. With uh, some, you know, some kind of adapter, somewhere somebody wrote it. So that's why, still, even if this theory is accepted, the Gospel of Matthew has no problem because the real author is Matthew. Okay. Is it, I know we started this conversation about, about talking about time and chronology and stuff. Yeah. Is it really important to understand the order of this, or is there a reason for knowing this, or is it just nice to know information? Yeah, this is all information. These are informations, you know. These but are why. The fact remains, there's still the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, but we're just trying to, to see where it's positioned itself. The pro it's like having the argument of, you know, which came first, the egg or the chicken? <laughs> <laughs> the problem is coming, you know, when somebody starts learning deeper and deeper and then asks questions. Why there are the same thing is repeated in three Gospels? And, and the same thing is written in different ways with variations. Variations. For example, a simple question is, as I told you once today, you know, when the Jacob, you know, the mother of Jacob and John came to Jesus and asked, Lord, so please, you know, uh, Give a position to my two sons in your, in your kingdom on the right and left side. The Gospel of Luke, I think. The Gospel of Luke says it. The mother comes and pleading to Jesus. The Gospel of Mark, if you just compare it with the same incident, what is the difference? That they ask themselves. The apostles themselves come and ask, Oh, Master. Give me position to both sides, you know, for us. Someone who really studied with the compa What's going on here? The same incident is, you know, narrated by Mark as by the apostles themselves. The same incident is reported by Luke by their mother. We then, don't know the answer to that. This worked for them, so they sent their mom. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so no, they want to put the blame on somebody else instead of themselves. That's really that is the answer. Because the mark that was the first one, Mark did not do anything, you know. Mark did as it is, as it was historically happened. But look, for example, written later, by the time the apostles were considered to be highest people, you know, in the church, having more honor and things like that, and an apostle coming and pleading to Jesus for positions that, you know, seem to be very bad, awkward. So, Luke changed a little bit. What? Putting the blame the, on the mouth of the mother. <laughs> hey, a mother always wants the best for their kids. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. And you know, very simply they can say, oh, no, no, the apostles do not ask. The mother. And the apostles kept, you know, probably somebody can, you know, interpret. No, they did not even wish that. <laughs> no? <laughs> well, to me, the reason... The reason that uh, one could wonder about this stuff is just because, uh, I mean, you want to be sure that, that what you believe in is, uh, is authentic, you know? Yeah, that is the other thing, you know. For example, what is written in gospel, you know, when we think about these things reasonably, then there comes the problems, you know. So we have to little bit understand the circumstance and things like that. Then it is very easy for us to, you know, interpret and understand. That's why we go on, the study is going on like this. Okay? Now, other, as I told you, that is uh, about the author, there is this, this discussion about the author of the Gospel of Matthew. Another problem now comes, or, pro or something, what we can see is, the author of Matthew, very clearly the book says nothing about the author of Matthew. I, the, I am, the, as Acts of the Apostles very clearly say, Luke, who is writing this one, is very clearly, precisely says it in Acts. But nothing, that kind of mention is made in Matthew. So we don't know exactly who is the author, but traditionally believed to be the, the apostle Matthew is the author of the gospel. The first gospel, okay? Matthew wrote Matthew. No, 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 not Ma ah, yeah. <laughs> Matthew wrote the gospel of Matthew, okay? Then, another thing is, but... But, you know, for example, another thing is, he must be, anyway, this, this author of Matthew must be a Jew. Because things which are written in the Gospel of Matthew could not be written by a, a pagan, because unfamiliar things for the pagans. For example, Matthew 5.17, sayings relating to Jesus' view of law and the kingdom. Law. A unfamiliar or a pagan who is unfamiliar with the, the Jewish customs and laws and things like that could not be, you know, easily right there. Or either at least someone who studied it or knew it. Somewhere or other connected with Judaism. So, most probably, he must, be, must have been a Jew. Another thing is, Jesus teaching about the taking of oaths very clearly says how to take the oath. Jesus teaching about almsgiving that's very clearly related with the, 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 the Jewish or teaching about fasting in the Jewish customs and traditions. Then parable speaking to Israel's status upon its rejection of Jesus. Messiah, he considered, you know, Jesus considered himself to be Messiah. So, and the, the, the Jews rejected him, therefore, you know, his, uh, you know, speaking about parable, you know, speaking about Jesus' uh, rejection. Then, um, see and you know Jesus uh, evaluation on Pharisees for example vote to Pharisees who are hypocrites and things like that all those things are very can be written by uh, somebody who knew Judaism very clearly very in depth so by, by the very fact that uh, the things narrated in, in, in the gospel of Matthew indicate that the author must be a Jew Another thing is, the audience who, to whom it is written, that is more important, and that we have to know. The author who wrote it may not be as important as the other one. But because the gospel, when we read certain things, if you have to understand it clearly, we have to understand to whom it is written. 
it is written to a Jewish audience. That's why always, and there are always a, what's called a back reference. This is written in order that the Old Testament prophecy to be fulfilled. And he gives that. So there are so many instances, for example. See, Old Testament messianic prophecies having always fulfilled by, for example, see, Matthew 1, 3, 1. For example, Matthew 1, 3, 1. <clears throat> Matthew 1, 23. Matthew 1, 23. If you can take in you know, Matthew 1, 23, what is it? <laughs> yeah. 1, 23. A virgin will become pregnant and have a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. Yeah, that is in uh, the reference to Isaiah 7, 14. It was a reference to Old Testament, Isaiah 7.14. Or Matthew 2.6. It's a reference to Mike 5.2. Or Matthew 2.15. A reference back to Hosea 11.1. 1. Or Matthew 2.18. And that is a reference to Jeremiah 31.15. And things like that. Always there is a reference back to the Old Testament. And mostly it is the cease to fulfill the prophecy in the Old Testament and the author of the Gospel of Matthew clearly wants to you know, establish that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Actually Matthew was, out of those three, Matthew was the only disciple of the twelve uh, besides John. Yeah. What Matthew was one of the twelve apostles, yeah. not Luke. Only. Luke and, and Luke and Mark, no. They learn from from them, them. and if they also in the uh, that time they were also called apostles because an apostle means the one who is sent, mm -hmm. right? Meaning only apostle. The word meaning apostle means one who is sent to preach. So at that time, not only the twelve, but others also were called apostles. Seventy. Seventy. They were also called uh, the the apostles, but. <clears throat> it makes more sense that Matthew was the one who the one, the real, yeah. He lived the life with Jesus. He was there. That doesn't mean you know need not be you know chronologically first. No, no. But his sources are the real. Oh, more, more authentic, more authentic. That's okay. You know that doesn't mean yeah. Yeah, yeah. That is okay. Another thing is then uh, there are there are some external external evidence that Matthew is the author of. Uh, uh, this because you know the old, many old you know the church fathers many church fathers testify that Matthew this book is written by Matthew for example Papias Papias he lived in between 60 to 130 he testifies that this book is written by Matthew or uh, see Irenaeus and 130 to 200 or uh, Origen and you know Eusebius uh, so all these people, you know, testify that this book is written by, by Matthew the Apostle. So from the very beginning of the church, when it, this book was appeared, you know, and people had the impression that it, it was written by Apostle Matthew. That is external evidence. Internal evidence we see. So the prophecies and many things in you know, referring to the Jewish customs and traditions, these are internal evidence that Matthew, the Apostle Matthew, or at least a Jew, is the, is the author of the... Another thing is, uh, as I told you, then what is the structure? There are at least two structures. I just give a little structure, and then we finish with that, you know, and I shall give the notes. I don't know whether I will be able to explain all these things, because it's a very a little bit complicated. There are two structures we can say. There is a there is a geographical structure. <coughs> Finish? It's a yes. Oh. <laughs> geographical structure. Geography. So geographical structure means there is a, for example Jesus starting his ministry in Galilee. Galilee, then going to, you know, passing to 
Jerusalem, so that is the end, no? Jerusalem, in between. So this is the structure by which you very clearly see, for example, we can see a, a, a geographical structure. Galilea, then journey to Jerusalem, that is a passing and Jerusalem ministry. So the Galilean ministry, then a passing. So he was, uh, uh, you know, he came from Nazareth, no? In the part of Galilee. So he made first his ministry there. Then he was passing to Jerusalem. It was a Matthew uh, foresee that kind of a, this is a, a travel eh, from the, uh, Galilee to Jerusalem. You know, days travel. So in between things happen. And in Jerusalem, what happens? So a, a what's called a geographical structure. So when we go from Galilee, what are things happen? Then what happens in Jerusalem? Things like that. There is another structure that is a little complicated one, but it's interesting to see. That is based on mostly what I said, you know, a little deeper understanding of the gospel that is based on a literary genre. You know, that means, you know, there are what's called, see, see, uh, uh, another thing, for example, even in, you know, in, in the geographical structure, if you need to see something about, first we can see a prologue. Enough to have this note, no? Do you need, you know, more explanation on that? You know, only thing is, uh, is it okay, you know, a geographical structure from Galilee to Jerusalem in between? For example, there is a prologue, then there is a, a preparation, you know, uh, for uh, ministry second then the first phase of uh, Jesus ministry in Galilee and then there is the second phase of mini Galilean ministry and then there is the uh, on the way on the way there is the Judean from in the period of in the Judea the ministry then what happens in Jerusalem this way we can even you know split it but at least you understand this much there is a geographical division from Galilee to Jerusalem and in between there is a, it's a passage so another thing is gospel of Matthew could be you know just understood you know can buy a kind of a five unit five unit five units of you know this the whole gospel could be divided into five units and all these five units having the same structure. That means there is a narrative, narrative, then there is a teaching, then three, and there is a summary statement. Statement. There is a narrative. Things happened. What are the things happened? There is a historical part. And based on that, there is a teaching part. And at the end, there is the a summary statement. Like that, there are five units in Gospel of Matthew. But that almost takes you through the three stages of interpretation, literally from the literal to the moral. Yeah, more, more. On this is the more literal general. And the summary is to take you to... to, to yeah. <laughs> so, for example, see... See, the first unit, let me just, uh, you know, uh, just an understanding, you know, just an understanding basis, just a basic understanding, and with that we finish. Narrative, you know, narrative, first one. So, from chapter 3, 1 to 4, the first unit, okay? Chapter 3, starting from chapter 3 to first to chapter 12. Chapter 12. Or what we can easier to say there is no need of a chapter three to twelve. That uh, that is the first unit. Chapter three to twelve. Yeah, the first part you know this uh, prologue and things like that is there. Are. So this five unit we can very clearly see the first unit we can see the first part in you know, a first chapter one to you know, chapter three to twelve. One, for example, there is the narrative part. Narrative part. Okay, I... There is a narrative part. 
That means, first, we can see chapter 3, 1 to 12. Now, see, uh, narrative part is chapter 3, 1 to chapter 4, 25. That is the narrative part. Narrative part. So, in which we can see John the Baptist, Jesus' baptism, Jesus' temptations, beginning of Jesus' Galilean ministry, Jesus calling for disciples, proclaim the good news of the kingdom. So, all these things are the historical narrative parts. Chapter 3, 1, 2, four, chapter 4, 25. Okay? Followed by there is a teaching part. Chapter 5, 2. Chapter 5. You understand what is it? Chapter 5. Mm -hmm. The Sermon on the Mount, no? Yes. Yeah, Sermon on the Mount. So, chapter 5, 1, 2, chapter 7, 27. All these things are you know, not very important. The only thing is that you see there is a narrative part. The second comes the mostly a section in which you know mostly teachings are given. What are the, for example teaching? There is the, the Beatitudes, then uh, the salt of the earth, then uh, you know you know he did not come for the abolish the law but to fulfill it. All those things are you know mostly connected with teachings. This part, chapter five to five six seven, just to see. And as for, e for easier understanding, chapter 5, 6, 7, now forming teaching. a teaching part. And at the end, the summary statement, chapter 3, no, chapter 7, chapter 7, 28, 29. So the first part, narrative, second part, teaching. Third part is a summary statement. This way, the whole Matthew's Gospel could be divided in five units. What about the rest of the chapters? Yeah, there, come, in, there comes the second unit, the third unit. <laughs> there are five units. Only, as I told you, you know, this is the first unit until 12. From comes the second unit, for example, comes from chapter 13. What about chapters 1 and 2? How oh, that is, you know, that's about, you know, that say uh, there are prologues and introductions and things like that. when he established that Jesus came from the, the, the genealogy. The genealogy. Yeah, genealogy and things like that, you know. Yeah. This is the. This is a. You know, we, if you look, you know, further into, further and deeper into, we can see a kind of a five units. Of course, outside there are many things. You know, for example, the infancy narratives and all those things are there. Yeah. So understand that. This is the first unit. Now, as it is, you know, there are second unit, third unit, fourth and fifth unit. You you. Thought, you know, oh, Bible study, it's very easy, you read it, <laughs> and you say whatever you want to say, no. If you really, if you, are, if you want to do business, you know, with the Bible, <laughs> you have to learn it very, you know, with pains. Thank you, Father. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking about your question about the importance of it. I don't think it's really important for us to learn, to know all the nuance, but to understand the church fathers just didn't sit down and make this stuff up. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of research. Even in the earliest days of the yes. church, there was a tremendous amount of research and painstaking study looking at this. Now, the only thing is that, you know, what he said, you know, is true. That is why I say, why we study this? The so only thing is a deeper understanding of that it's for our illumination of mind. It doesn't, you know, these studies are not, you know, you can, you are free to accept it or not. You can outrightly say, oh, no, no, I don't accept these things, you know, that's okay. And the church doesn't say anything about it, no problem. You just want to have, you know, just to read the Bible and, you know, this is the way, that's okay. But 
why we study these are you know these are helpful tools for understanding a deeper meaning of bible and if we know something deeper what is the consequence we are more deeply you know faith rooted when some people then come you know for example the when the when the parts or people you know part pentecostal people come and then argue this and that you know we can very easily say no 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 that's not the right thing you see this is the way also we can see or we can see you know uh, next time and i say something about the for example the deuter canonical books of the you know, old testament the protestant say the trent council added the deuter canonical there are seven books for example deuter canonical book seven books they are for example uh, i just you know made the 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 deuter canonical judith oh, yeah. tobit first and second macbeth wisdom baruch and ecclesiastics so these are the seven books of the deuter canonical you, you don't see in the in the in the protestant bible they say they say this was added by the catholic church by the trent council what nonsense they are talking you know they just just want to say that what really happened you know they just made you know just they removed it that is the reality they removed it from the bible it was so from the very beginning of the church these books were accepted as divinely inspired canon of the bible for example as i told you you know 367 when patriarch alexandria no when he enumerated 72 books these were there origin when it is you know enumerated in 3200 you know 300 and you know before that before you know he was you know these books were there and the church was taking it and when was the trent council it was in 1545 Well, that's after that's after even even more than a thousand years, years. and uh, the church was accepting these books as inspired books the church was accepting is as inspired books and the protestants you know they because you know some of their teachings were not correspondingly agree, agreeable with these things for example machabees so uh, life after death and you know mm, uh, you know praying for them you know the protestant don't want to do that you know therefore they just removed it from the bible and what they say they say the catholic church added it <laughs> no yes that is the way they interpret it the catholic church but the historical record says otherwise i mean it's in history the problem is that you know when you write these things you know and somebody reads that he doesn't go for a historical research for that yeah he okay the latin the first time it all went in the latin saint jerome around 350 or something guess which seven books he has in the old bible and these guys pull it out 1000 years later yeah that's all so and they say in the catholic church that's why you know I, why i did i say this when they see say, say these things if you don't have a, a little understanding of these things we are you know very submissive what they say and so is it, is it so <laughs> what what's really I mean is they you know, cuz the Hebrew, the the Jews removed those seven books too yeah they they removed it and uh Ironically, Hanukkah comes from those books. <laughs> and uh, you know, my my rabbi friend absolutely loves the Maccabees. I mean, he loves reading the Maccabees. He's fascinated by it. 